Welcome friends to the course on Introduction to Free and Open Source Software. In this lecture, I will be introducing to you the basic concepts of free and open source software. I will be explaining to you what free and open source software means, how and why it came into existence and why we should use and promote free and open source software. Once again, let me remind you that there will be nothing technical in this software, in, sorry, in this course or in this lecture and everything will be on a historical basis. I mean, I will be introducing to you the historical developments of free and open source software. Uh, it will be just be basic trivia stuff and that sort of stuff. There will be nothing technical and you don't have to be a programmer or a person who understands hi-fi technology to go through this course. So once again welcome to the course and I hope you will enjoy it. So what is free and open source software? Now we have two terms here free and then we have open source. The first thing that you should understand from free and open source software is that the word free need not necessarily mean that it is free of cost. We always have a tendency to associate the word free with price. Now that is not the case here. The free in free and open source software means freedom. It should be said that free as in free speech and not as in free beer. So free software is a software that entitle, entitles you with certain freedom and that is what free software is all about. Now let's classify software. Now software can be classified into four types that is proprietary software, shareware, freeware and free software. Now, proprietary software is a software where a company or a person developing the software has all the rights to the software. He can decide on how even the user should use the software, what the user can do and what the user cannot do with the software. So you pay a price to the developer, gives you the binaries of the software, you can execute the software but you are not allowed to study the software, how it works, you are not allowed to view the source code of the software or to modify it. Now in shareware, it is something a bit different from proprietary but at the same time it is something similar to proprietary software. In shareware, you are free to download the source code, sorry, download the software and use it but again you are restricted the access to the source code. So you cannot view the source code but you can use the software free of cost, it will not cost you any money, uh, maybe sometimes a few features might be locked in the free mode and you have to pay money to ensure that all the features are available but otherwise shareware comes free of cost but again you do not have freedom. Freeware as the name says itself is free of cost but here free does not mean freedom. That is the basic difference between freeware and free software. In freeware, you get a software free of cost, but you do not get the source code. You are not free to access, sorry, modify or share the freeware, but you can get the software free of cost. Now in free software, you get the software, you may or may not get the software free of cost, but once you get the software, you get the source code of the software along with it. You are free to study the source code, you are free to modify the source code and you are also free to share with whoever you like. Now that is the basic difference between free software and freeware. Now this classification was made just to make sure that all of you understand that free software need not necessarily mean software free of cost. So what is freedom? The dictionary definition of freedom is that the absence of necessity, coercion or constraint in choice or action. In layman terms, freedom is your ability or uh, the circumstances in which you can do whatever you like without being uh, res restricted by someone else. So, but you have to make sure that you do not uh, uh, restrict the freedom of others while you exercise your own freedom. So, that is what freedom is all about. And the history is full of revolutions for freedom. Man has always been wanted to be a free person, to think freely, to speak freely and to live a free life. So the world is full of examples. Uh, it dates back to the BC uh, period and some of the most common, the most famous revolutions of our times are 
the american revolution the french revolution the indian struggle for freedom and many more i mean look around you look the newspapers go through the newspapers you can always see a fight for freedom uh, the rebe- uh, the revolution that happened in egypt all are examples of uh, man's want for freedom so that is what free software is all about it is freedom in the digital age no so what was the need for a revolution in the software industry i mean a revolution in the sense uh, a fight for freedom in the software industry see in the early 1950s companies made money by selling their hardware the software that was required to run these hardware were distributed free of cost and also and also they were distributed with a freedom that means whenever a company made a computer system or anything similar to that kind whatever software runs on that system was also given to the buyer or user of the system even the source code of that software was given to the user of the system so that the user could modify it as he or she wish wished uh, we could have your own custom made software from the basic software that the companies have made but soon companies started realizing that they could make money even more money by selling the software because without the software the hardware is useless it's practically useless so so the software industry started dominating it began to grow and it started dominating and soon most of the software that was available free of cost started to be commercialized so people were no longer given access to the source code uh, and some people really got frustrated by this trend um, initially there was an operating system called unix that was that was considered to be a develop a programmer's uh, operating system it was a multitasking multi user operating system but again it was for the programmers it was difficult for the common man to understand and use it and it can be understood that in the early days computers personal systems were laptops uh, laptops i don't think even existed in that time but computers were not a common man's thing it was only found in research institutes universities and such places so so unix was a, was an operating system that was meant for the programmers and the intelligent the the researchers and that sort of people so that was again something that was available free of cost and which had freedom associated with it but once companies started they started understanding the potential that the software industry had they started selling all these they started commercializing all these softwares so the first person to come out of the, to come out and start a revolution was a hacker in the artificial intelligence lab of mit in 1983 Richard Matthew Stallman declared that he is going to make the GNU operating system. Now, before I come to GNU, let me explain to you what an operating system is. Operating system is just a piece of software that runs on your system. For example, your computer, it will have many hardware devices like the processor, the hard disk, the keyboards, the CD drives, the mouse, the screen. So all these hardwares have to be integrated together. and all these hardwares have to be controlled and monitored by one piece of software that is what the operating system does now we interact with the computer through an application layer through different applications these uh, the information from these applications is sent to the kernel which sends the information to the hardware so kernel is again a part of an operating system which takes the information from the application layer that is from the inputs that we as users give and it is translated into it is it is given to the uh, it interacts with that information to the hardware and correspondingly we get the outputs or whatever so that is what an operating system does and uh, stallman what he did was he decided to make an operating system that ensured freedom to all its users and he named it as gnu Now the expansion of GNU is GNU is not Unix, so you can see a GNU again in that expansion, and that will expand again. So this is a recursive, uh, recursive expansion. Uh, maybe it was something that amused Stallman, and so, and thus the GNU operating system was declared, 
and soon, that is in 1985, he founded the Free Software Foundation and urged all the programmers to join this revolution. Now he did that by writing a GNU manifesto. You can have, uh, you can go through the copy of GNU manifesto in the link provided below. Uh, it will help you in understanding more what free software is all about. And so, Starman started with the GNU manifesto, and in 1991, a computer science student from Finland called Linus Torvalds released the kernel and named it Linux and he uploaded it on the internet. Now I explain to you what a kernel is. Kernel is the heart or it is the core of an operating system that interacts with the hardware. So Torvalds made Linux and uploaded it on the internet. Now Linux was something that was derived from Minix which was made by Andrew S. Tannenbaum. He was a professor of computer science and uh, he has written a famous book on operating systems. Now, along with this textbook of his, he used to distribute copies of Minix so that students can understand, program and uh, understand the concepts of an operating system. So Minix was a piece of code or a piece of software that Tannenbaum distributed so that students are free to modify and understand it. What Linus Torvalds did was, he modified Minix, made Linux and he uploaded it on the internet so that users all over the world can have a look at it, programmers all over the world can have a look at it and study about it and modify it if they wished to. Now all this happened when the GNU operating system was stuck at a point. The problem was Stallman had made all the applications needed for an operating system or he was making all the applications needed for an operating system but the kernel of the operating system he was making was not running as smoothly as expected. Now the kernel for the GNU operating system was named as GNU Herd, but still it was not uh, running as smoothly as expected. And once Stallman tweeted in Twitter that uh, we never thought GNU Herd was going to be that hard. Now that was something wrong that went with the planning of the GNU kernel and uh, it was at this time that Linux was uh, introduced into the world and in 1992 Linux was released under the GNU public license. I will explain more about the GPL license in the coming lectures but for now just understand that it is a license that ensures freedom to the user. Now in 1992 Linux was released under the GPL license and Stallman decided to adopt it as the GNU kernel. So thus, uh, a new class of operating systems called the GNU Linux operating systems were born where GNU formed the application layer and Linux formed the kernel layer. So thus, uh, so the, all the operating, all the Linux operating systems that we see today like Red Hat, Fedora, Ubuntu, all are actually GNU or GNU Linux operating systems because they all have Linux in their kernel and the uh, application layer is made of is made of applications in the GNU uh, GNU application. They are made of the GNU applications. So, so this again started the revolution, and programmers had hoped that they will be able to regain their freedom to learn, modify, create, and share software. So, in 1997, another famous computer scientist, Eric S. Raymond, wrote a paper called "The Cathedral and the Bazaar." What he did in this paper was he outlined two models of free software development. They were the cathedral model and the bazaar model. Now in the cathedral model, it is a model where uh, I will uh, explain this with an example to you. Suppose I make uh, the version 1 of a software X. Now I release the software X uh, version 1 along with its source code uh, for the people to use. And once you start using the software X, you realize that there are some faults, there are some bugs in the software and you request for addition of new features, removal of those bugs, etc. Now, the team again sits to uh, rectify all these faults and thus the version 2 of software X is made and it is released. Again, the version 2 of software X is released with the new source code. but the development process, the transition from uh, version 1 to version 2 
is not available to the common user. All the common user sees is the final running code of the software. Now this is what the cathedral model does. The developmental code, the code that uh, uh, the coding that happens during the development of the software is not visible to the users. All they see is the final source code and they are free to study it. Now that is what the cathedral model does. Uh, only a exclusive group of programmers see the developmental code. But in the BASAR model, uh, the whole source code is uploaded on the internet from the very beginning. So as changes keep on happening, the users or anyone who wants has access to the source code and they can see what all changes are happening uh, on a regular basis. So the GNU was made with the cathedral model and Linux was made by the BASAR model. So that will be um, quite necessary for your understanding about the cathedral model and the BASAR model. And uh, uh, so uh, a company called Next Netscape Communications got inspired by this paper and they released their Nets Netscape communication suite as free software. Now, you may be wondering what the Netscape communicator is. Nowadays, it is known by another popular name, which is uh, Mozilla Firefox and Thunderbird. Now, this was now this uh, made Raymond and other computer scientists to think, why not introduce the free software concepts into the commercial world so that the free software movement gets much more attention and momentum than the present condition. So they sat together, they discussed and they found out that the word free software is not going to gain much uh, attention in the commercial world uh, among the company, among the companies that manufacture software. So they, re, uh, they rephrased the whole thing and they a new term called open source was coined. Now that pretty much the word open source explains what free software is all about. That means the source is open to everyone to develop. So the word free will not confuse you that uh, the software is available the free of cost or anything like that. Now, so in this lecture we have seen what free and open source software means. Uh, we have seen how free software movement started and why it started. Uh, we have seen some famous names associated with free and open source software. So what I would like to tell you is that to put it in simple terms, consider buying a car. Free and open source software is something similar to it. See, in order to buy a car, you have to pay money. So free software, it may or may not come free of cost, but it need not necessarily mean it is free of cost. So it is just like buying a car. No, you pay money, you buy a car, and once you buy the car, you are free to use it in any manner you wish. So it, you can change its color, you can alt, alter, uh, you can do alterations on the car, uh, you can lend it to somebody, you can resell it. You can do anything you want with the car once you have paid money for it and once you own it. The same case is with free and open source software. Once you own the software, once you buy the software or if you get it for free, good. Uh, if you don't get it for free, you pay the money, get the software. But once the software is yours, you are free to do anything with it. You are free to study its source code. You are free to modify its source code. You are free to uh, uh, resell your software. You are free to share your software for free. So that is what free and open source software is all about. You are basically the user should have the right to know what is happening with the software, what code his software is executing in the system. So that is what free software is all about. I hope you have understood the basic concept of free and open source software and in the coming lectures I will explain to you why this is important and I will show you some more terms and some more developments that happen in the history of free and open source software. So a book that I will suggest for you to read is The Rebel Code. You might find some important historical background of free and open source in that book so if possible get a copy of the rebel code and try reading it for now thank you this is all in lecture one uh, see you all in lecture two thank you